Good morning. If everyone can come in, get a seat, finish your breakfast, we're going to get started. There are some, not surprisingly, some seats up front here, so feel free if you don't have one to uh, come right up, get a front row seat. So welcome everyone. My name is Ed Riskin. I'm the Director of Transportation here in San Francisco. I'm also the president of NACDO, and so I'm kind of doubly excited to be able to uh, invite you and welcome you and host you all here in San Francisco for the 2014 Designing Cities Conference. Uh, it's, a, it's a great time to be in San Francisco. Of course, the, the weather is beautiful. It's an even-numbered year, so the Giants are in the World Series. <laughs> and. Um, but you know, since this is NACTO, uh, we're also kind of happy for you to see the, the really diverse transportation system we have here and, and hope you'll get an opportunity to ride a cable car or historic streetcar, to, to jump on a bike share, to, and really to walk around. Uh, we're one of the most walkable cities, or at least we like to think so. We've got great neighborhoods uh, and hope you can really get out and, and see you know, what's, what's out there on the streets, uh, a lot of which really reflects NACTO-like design or NACTO-inspired design. And that, I think, is really a reflection of the work of a lot of the people in this room. Um, NACTO is about sharing best practices from cities around the country. And uh, you, you'll see as you go out and about our city the things that might look like uh, what you have in your city. And that's because we stole them from you. And, and likewise, anything you see here that you want to take back to your city, um, a, a lot of this now has come together in our design guides. Um, and we have a lot of work to do here, but, but you know, a lot that we're proud of that we've done. And a lot of that is due to a lot of the SFMTA people in the room and a, a lot who aren't in the room. But so for those who, who are going to be participating in the conference the next couple of days, I do encourage you to try to, to get to know them and uh, pick their brains and, and share information. But really happy to have you all here. The other great thing that we have about uh, to kind of brag about in San Francisco is we have a great mayor. And uh, I say that uh, in part just as, as a resident. Um, I, I live here, my family's here, uh, I work here. Um, but also, and particularly as the transportation director, uh, we have a mayor who really understands infrastructure, understands transportation, understands design, understands how these things are really important to the quality of life that we have here in the city and to the economy of the city. And he, he understands this in one, I think, in part uh, because he was a public works director, which I think is a great pedigree. Uh, it's my own bias, having been one also. Um, he was also a city administrator that, among other things, was the architect of the city's 10-year capital plan, uh, which is now institutionalized in the city, but it was a process by which we started really thoughtfully inventorying, evaluating, and investing in the city's most critical assets. Um, it's been a very successful program, and it, it was really the, the mayor's sense, uh, then city administrator's sense of the importance of the infrastructure, the bones of a city, uh, and the design uh, of a city uh, that, that's got that plan uh, in place and as successful as it's been. And then further, uh, as if that weren't enough, last year, Mayor Lee convened a task force of about 45 leaders from around the city specifically charged with looking at transportation infrastructure. Out of that process, they've recommended $3 billion of new local revenues to invest in our transportation system, not just to accommodate all the growth that's coming to San Francisco, and you've probably seen a lot of the cranes in the sky, but to invest in, in the state of good repair of our core system, our core transit system, and the safety of our streets. Uh, $3 billion worth of new revenue, so you can imagine it, being the transportation director in a city and your mayor comes, brings together the leadership of the city and comes out with the recommended $3 billion to, to invest in the transportation system. It, it doesn't get much better than that. Um, fortunately, I don't think he's on the market, so I'm not too worried that you're going to try to steal him to come be your mayor. Uh, but we're very happy that he's ours. So please join me in welcoming the mayor of the city and county of San Francisco, Ed Lee. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that kind introduction, Ed. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to San Francisco. Uh, actually, 
uh, the last couple of weeks, uh, as I've been going around this wonderful city, people have been walking up, goes, you're, you're, ma- you're, yeah, I'm Travis Ishikawa. <laughs> That's it. Uh, and so I'm Mayor Travis Ishikawa for a few weeks. So, uh, but anyway, I want to say thank you, th- Ed, thank you very much uh, for your leadership, uh, not only as our uh, Director of Transportation, but certainly the President of NATCO. And I am thrilled that you're here in our city. Uh, I know that uh, you are about to see, if not already, a lot of things that are happening in our city. And uh, we want to make sure that uh, the themes that you have for this conference about cities, about innovation, about mobility can be demonstrated right here in our city. So while you're here, uh, please make sure if you can do all you can to walk, to bike, uh, to take Uh, ride sharing. Uh, Just be careful on those double-decker tourist buses. We have a few problems with a couple of those. They go around our city preaching different viewpoints. Um, But I think you've already, and if you haven't, I encourage you to uh, go down and see our uh, Transbay Transit Center, uh, certainly under construction. Uh, When you're down around that area, you can probably hear it and feel it, uh, just as we do with our central subway. Uh, We're working hard to get those projects done. Those are not only uh, important projects, they're historic projects for our city. And for the Transbay Transit Center, as many of you have read, and it's it's true, we intend not only to have electrified Caltrain come through there, but it will certainly be the northern terminus of our high-speed rail for the state of California. We believe that's important uh, to our entire region to get that done. And we're glad to be working with Governor Brown to make sure that Uh, we're investing properly. Uh, I want to say I'm also excited for this conference because we've got the brightest minds in transportation right here and I want to say thank you. Uh, I also want to make sure I give a shout out to all of the mayors of the cities that you're from as well. I get a chance uh, to work with all of them and uh, they uh, either appoint you or hire you or they certainly work very closely with you and I want to thank the other mayors because When we get together, we have a very important committee, uh, transportation, and we're always sharing best practices, ideas, uh, things that cause us uh, to work together on a national level. Uh, And I think it's really great to have a former mayor of Charlotte uh, now become the DOT transportation secretary because uh, all of us as mayors go through that experience of learning everything it takes to run a great city And when you're working on a national level, you never, ever forget uh, not only potholes, uh, but uh, where all the challenges are in the city. Uh, So I think that's going to be very, very helpful. San Francisco is very proud to be now one of the 40 cities and uh, certainly the state of California, one of the seven states that have officially endorsed uh, your NATCO Urban Street Design Guides. We're glad to do that. Uh, you should give a shout out because you're making a great impact across the country. And I want to just take a moment to thank our local supervisor, my supervisor actually from my district, uh, Supervisor Scott Weiner, because it was him that sponsored the legislation to make sure that we can endorse the NATCO guidelines here in San Francisco. Uh, I certainly want to again recognize uh, Ed Riskin is serving as the president of NATCO and uh, We've had a chance, too, as well, to work with many of your leadership and former leadership. And I want to just give a shout out to uh, Jeanette Sadikhan for her leadership as the past uh, former NATCO president, and certainly for her great work, her groundbreaking work in New York under Mayor Bloomberg. And I know Polly's going to be doing a lot of great stuff there as well. Uh, And I keep reminding everybody, my daughters are in New York, so you got to take care of them, too. We already know that uh, streets make up 80% of our uh, public realm and we have to take care of that. Here we are, uh, we've got important propositions, but as you go around the city, not only is the Transbay Transit Center, the uh, Central Subway work that we're doing, uh, but take a look at what we've done in certain areas of the city that used to be freeways. Uh, Before the Loma Prieta earthquake, we had freeway ramps along Octavia Boulevard. We had them along Embarcadero Boulevard, and we certainly had them in Chinatown along Broadway. And if you now take a look, and if you ride through them, you'll uh, see wonderful places, popular projects that include 
uh, housing and multiple modes of transportation uh, along Octavia, along Embarcadero, uh, even Broadway, we're building family housing. There used to be all freeway ramps and we're making all of those corridors exciting and wonderful and uh, it's especially important because literally this month is 25th anniversary of the Loma Prieta earthquake and we've become a stronger city since that time. We're also trying to make sure that our streets are safe for everyone. That's uh, a huge responsibility of all of us mayors across the country. It is actually a shared responsibility of all of our transportation experts that are right in this room. Safety on our streets. Uh, you don't know how it hurts to hear news reports of seniors crossing streets and getting hit by, by vehicles or trucks or bicyclists uh, where a big truck can't see turning around the corner uh, or uh, pedestrians not looking both ways and we're educating people in multiple languages these days. Uh, no matter what color that light is and whether you got the right of way, you could be dead right. Uh, and we're here to educate a lot of our public about the need to all the traffic to slow down, uh, people to be much more aware. But ultimately, within this room, your street designs are going to be of great help. And we have a very big investment in our city. Uh, we have a proposition uh, this November that uh, submits that part of that uh, $3 billion that Ed was mentioning. We have the first $500 million of it in a proposition of $300 million of which will be focused on uh, making sure our streets are designed and signalized and signage so that we can get to zero deaths. Our Vision Zero is a serious goal for us uh, because we're all united about preventing uh, the deaths and fatalities along our streets. Uh, so I want to say thank you for your leadership on that. You know, I can talk on and on all morning, but I know you have wonderful panelists this morning. Uh, I hear that uh, even former staff here at, uh, uh, are now heading up agencies in Los Angeles. Uh, and you've got people from all over the country uh, here to share, to talk through, and I'm excited. I want to really know what you're all talking about and what you think would be the best approaches. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a mayor that wants to make sure our cities are successful. We cannot do that without having successful transportation. To me, transportation is the great equalizer. Uh, I know uh, Mayor de Blasio and I have a lot of conversations with other mayors across the country about income inequality and, and all the challenges that we have about economics. But when you get to transportation, and certainly for our city, you, you'll ride a muni bus or a trolley uh, or the BART, and you'll be standing right next to a CEO of probably a billion dollar corporation and on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's because people need to get things done and we have transportation that unites them uh, all throughout the city. We wanna keep going that way because that equalizer gets everybody to work, gets them back home, gets them to their families and gets them to Giants games, particularly the World Series. <laughs> uh, so you'll see a little bit more orange uh, than you're used to. I was gonna say, cause we're early celebrants of Halloween, but it's a little bit more than that. Uh, and uh, I hope that you'll take in a lot of the celebrations that we expect to have while you're here. Have a lot of fun. Uh, but again, uh, please know that you have a mayor here and a city that hosts you that really cares about the work that you do. Thank you for having your conference here in San Francisco. Thank you very much, Mayor Lee. Uh, you can see with the leadership like that, it makes the, our, our work all the more, uh, all the more easy. Uh, so now we're, we're gonna move into our panel. I see folks standing in the back. Please feel free to come in. There's, there, there are seats up front. Maybe uh, somebody had the idea yesterday. If there's an empty seat near you, raise your hand. So go find the people with the hands raised. Um, I'm gonna ask our panelists to come forward, uh, make their way to the stage. Um, and I'd like to introduce our moderator. Uh, we have a, a rich media tradition here in the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, a number of strong voices, a number of seasoned professionals, and we're happy to be joined uh, by one of those, one of the, the most respected voices uh, in San Francisco. She's a longtime member of the ABC family here in San Francisco. She's an award 
winning journalist, Emmy Award, Gracie Awards, um, and so we're really delighted to have her here. Please join me in welcoming Cheryl Jennings. Thank you, guys. Good morning, everybody. I'm assuming my microphone is on. Can you hear me in the back? Okay, great. If all our panelists could come on up, and you must be Salita. I am. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. All right. Um, if you've noticed that I was looking down at my phone, that is because I am tweeting. It's okay for you to have your phones on during this, except for the bell. Um, our hashtag is NACTO14, and the at, the symbol for today is NACTO. So we'd love it if you would tweet about this event and share the good news at, uh, about this conference. Mayor Ed Lee, did you notice he was wearing a Giants pin? Pretty cool. Um, so welcome, everybody. Um, I am delighted to be here. I had the opportunity and great privilege to work with Ed Riskin on a program talking about transportation. And I'm eager to learn more just to become a better journalist and to talk about transportation in general. And I am eager to learn about what all of you are doing in your city. So just to let you know who our guests are today, they're in your program, and their bios are there. I'm going to go in alphabetical order. Robin Hutchison, which, who is right there, okay, from Salt Lake City, Director of Transportation. And Danny Pleasant on the end, Transportation Director, City of Charlotte. You, you've met Ed. San Francisco, Salita Reynolds, General Manager for Los Angeles. And Polly Trottenberg, the Commissioner in New York. So please give them a warm welcome. Right, so I had to drive here today because my schedule is erratic. So I'm curious to know from our panelists how each of them gets to work, not during a conference, because Danny, you told me you took the elevator. So, right. so, <laughs> so that was convenient. But just on a normal basis, Polly, how do you get to work? Uh, I actually make it a point to try and use every mode every week if I can. So sometimes I drive, sometimes I take the subway, sometimes I take bike share, because I'm lucky I can bike over the Brooklyn Bridge to get to work. That is nice. Yeah. And Salita, how about you? Uh, I usually take the bus or I ride my bike. Um, I do have, uh, for the first time ever, a parking space, uh, which has only been used once. So sadly, it's been very lonely there. I'm just looking for. And Ed? Uh, most days I have about a 10 or 15 minute walk to uh, Muni Underground and I take Muni. All right. I do different things on different days, similar to Polly. I uh, occasionally drive. I will take the bus and the train into work with one transfer. I ride my bike often, and my favorite is, is walking from my house to work, which is 2.4 miles away. How about you, Danny? Well, since I represent a, a southern su sunbelt city that was uh, largely built in the age of the automobile, I'll, I have to admit that I do drive to work. Uh, but I will also say that uh, my drive is, is a whopping 10 minutes, so I live very close to my work. I, I, I do need a car to, to get around our 300 square miles of city uh, daily to uh, go to meetings, visit projects, uh, visit our, with our crews and that sort of thing. So I'm, I'm the guy that's not particularly multimodal okay. uh, in my day, but I, I do try to keep the, the driving to a minimum by living okay. close by. That's good. And on that note, I want to talk about public transportation and converting from gas and diesel to hybrids or whatever thing. Have you, have you noticed? Let me start with you, Danny. Um, have you made those changes, or you're in the process, or is it difficult? Well, um, we are we are a fairly new uh, uh, rail city uh, for fixed guideway rail. Except I, I do like to look at my maps of 1928 when we had 35 miles of streetcars serving our, our central city. Uh, but in 2012 or 2007, rather, we opened our first uh, light rail line. We're under construction with another 10 miles of it today and we're also under construction with a streetcar so those are, are all electric powered uh, from our bus transit fleet we have integrated uh, quite a number of hybrid vehicles into that fleet as well um, so we haven't gone all electric yet but we uh, certainly are hybrid uh, certainly uh, clean burning diesel is part of our inventory as well all right thanks and Polly you've got the huge huge city and so what, that must be a huge challenge for you, to uh, convert and to get everything away from gas and diesel. Uh, New York comes with a tremendous plus, I think, compared to a lot of other cities in the country. It already has a huge number of transit riders. So uh, you know, in that regard, we start off being pretty green. 
Um, you know, our subway system and our bus system, uh, there's been a process of converting now to, you know, renewable fuels and, and natural gas. But, you know, one thing in New York, the, particularly the bus system there, it takes such an extraordinary pounding and such a high volume of people. Uh, we often have to sort of find our own special solutions to, you know, hybrid buses, things like that, because mm -hmm. things that are the prototypes in other parts of the country don't always work in New York. Right. And Salida in Los Angeles, I mean, it's so spread out, it must be really difficult to figure out how to make all that work. So, uh, you know, Los Angeles City, we're a city in a county like San Francisco, but we have a lot of other cities inside Los Angeles County, and the, the agency that sort of does the transit for the county is different from the Department of Transportation. Um, and at the, at the moment, there's actually more uh, light rail construction underway in Los Angeles than anywhere in, in North America. Um, so there's a huge push to get to a build out of a system that, that, uh, that the city and the county really desperately need. Um, but the city itself, the Department of Transportation, we operate a, a transit system that has about 26 million boardings a year. Um, but because it's relatively new, um, it was pretty easy to, um, you know, we, we were sort of ahead of the curve. We let everybody do all of the painful beta testing ahead of us, and by the time we purchased our fleet, um, it's, a, it's a very clean fleet. All right. Robin, how about your city? We are very lucky to have the Utah Transit Authority as an organizing agency for transit in Salt Lake City, and they are on the leading edge. They have a, I'll speak a little bit on, on their behalf right now, they have a very singular focus right now to construct a brand new bus maintenance facility that will house a significant expansion of their natural gas bus um, operation. Um, in addition to that, there's something called the WAVE Project, um, and we're uh, partnering with the University of Utah and with UTA to test all um, electric buses that are charged through, uh, I'm not gonna say this right, but discs that sit under the pavement that provide electricity up through the buses. So um, very progressive. Uh, we're, it's beta testing, so we're, um, as a community, not rolling it out as fast as we'd like to, but I think it's coming, coming very quickly. And Ed, our city has so many hills. <laughs> So you've got all sorts of different types of transportation to deal with in terms of converting and... We, we do. Uh, <clears throat> we also, um, kind, of, kind of like Charlotte, we had a very extensive streetcar network here in San Francisco, 50 different lines if you look at the old map, which, which makes me sad when I look at that map uh, since many of them were ripped out. But fortunately what San Francisco did was uh, leave the electric infrastructure in place so our current, the remaining light rail lines, uh, but as well as a, a big percentage of our bus fleet uh, runs on electricity uh, from those overhead lines, so they're zero emission vehicles. So if you add up the, the trains and the electric buses, it's more than half the fleet. And the electricity comes from clean hydropower. So uh, th that, that side of the fleet is very clean. The, the balance are, uh, we're in the process of converting from uh, all conventional diesel buses to biodiesel electric hybrid uh, vehicles, so, so they'll get uh, a lot cleaner as well. Um, but I think what's probably true for most, if not all of us, is here in San Francisco, the transportation sector generates about 40% of the greenhouse gas emissions. Our transit system is about one or two percentage points of that. So even if we had the cleanest system in the world and didn't uh, emit a speck of, of CO2 or any other kind of emissions, <clears throat> it's that other, it's that balance that's right. more, that it's, it's the cars and the trucks um, that are really responsible uh, for the greenhouse gas emissions in our city, and that's really what we need to move the needle on uh, if we're going to make a difference in terms of climate change. You know, and anybody can jump in on these questions. A lot of you talked about riding a bicycle to work, and San Francisco is very, very bicycle friendly. We have very good group of activist bicycle coalitions here who work on that. So I'm wondering how much that is contributing to the welfare of your city, to people moving around, just to good health, and the, what the conflicts are with the other population, because there are conflicts. Um, you've heard of our critical mass on once a month where people on bicycles take over a certain part of the city, which is great for them, but sometimes it's frustrating for people trying to get home on a Friday night. So. Anybody want to talk about the importance of bicycling? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Molly. Go ahead. Jump in there. I think it's logical I should start. And I noticed, I think uh, Chicago had a sign up in the cities there that said, we're number two on cycling. New York City is now number one, All right. according to Cycling Magazine. So um, we're very proud of that. Uh, you know, cycling has been 
somewhat transformative in New York, and I think it's starting to take hold in a lot of other cities. It's impressive in San Francisco when you see the hills here uh, to see how much people are embracing cycling. Um, you know, it is a mode of transportation that is tremendously inexpensive to provide and, you know, emits no carbon and uh, burns no fuel and connects people to their cities and helps tackle obesity. And, and, you know, New Yorkers have really embraced it, you know, through building a lot of bike lanes, putting in city bike, trying to think of some other ways that we can encourage it. But it is true, you know, it, and look, I know there are a lot of people in this room who are veterans of, you know, some of the political battles you have, particularly in dense cities, you know, street space is precious. So how do you balance the needs of everyone? Because I know that we've got a good education program here going on. I mean, I think that's, that's sort of an ongoing process to balance the needs of everyone. But one thing you see with cycling is it's a bit of a virtuous circle, which is the more you provide bike lanes and, and bike share and things like that, the more people will take it up and then the more it becomes an accepted and popular mode of transportation. You know, one of the great sort of big mistakes of American transportation policy writ large that really played out in urban America is we overinvested in, you know, particularly autos. And you know, once you've invested heavily in that mode of transportation, it makes it hard for other modes to get taken up. But now I think the cities up here and cities all around the country are starting to undo that. Anybody else want to weigh in on that? Salt Lake City is a very typical Western city. We had a, a strong pattern of sprawl through our 60s, 70s, even into the 80s, 90s started to pull back, 2000s really focusing in again on our capital city, Salt Lake City, Provo, Orem, some cities. Um, and we have a lot of space. We have a lot of space in our roadways. And for a, a transportation professional, you look at that space and go, well, we can do whatever we want. We, there's just, it's 120 feet across. We can do a lot. Uh, but people are really attached to that space. <coughs> Turns out. Uh, and when you... <laughs> When you're trying to do some conversion, all this emotion, uh, this emotion comes out. But, I, but I'll tell you with the bicycling, we're not just out there making change to make change. Our community is saying, hurry up. Hmm. Hurry up and do this already. They've been asking for a long time. When we make the change, there's controversy, but the bike lanes fill up, the traffic is moving, and it's working. Um, and I'll say, too, that for us, we, I think it's the same. I'm a, it's the same for all of us and probably all of you. Uh, the demographic is changing, and we know this already. This is, this is remedial for this group, but you know, driving trend going down, walking, biking, transit trends going up, and the demand for this is going up. And so if we want to prepare cities for the future, building better bicycling facilities and really all of our, all of our modes is, is really the, what we have to do. I agree. I think you, the public is telling us how they want to use the streets, and the question is whether or not design can catch up. So Los Angeles is, you know, the car capital, or I forget what all of the things that people have told me it is. Um, but in my short time there, that's not what I've seen. I've seen people showing how they want to use the streets in a different way, and the design of the streets has not caught up. All of the big city problems that we face around public health and injury prevention, economic development, resilience, sustainability, all of those have to do with transportation. Transportation can create those outcomes, and it's really not about the bike. It's about the fact that the bike is one way to get to all of these outcomes that our city leaders and our public really wants us to get to. And our challenge is being able to articulate how, through data and through real sort of stories, how these changes to the space that people are so attached mm -hmm. to can get to these huge outcomes that we're all sort of trying to, we're all after. All right, I want to, everybody's talking about safety, and Mayor Ed Lee was talking about driver safety, pedestrian safety, and of course, bicyclist safety. That's been a big issue in San Francisco, I'm sure in other cities, um, and the program called Vision Zero and how well that is working. So Ed, let me start with you on Vision Zero. So last year in San Francisco, 34 people died, uh, just trying to make their way around the city, trying to cross mm -hmm. the street, uh, trying to ride their bike to work, and uh, culminated with, I think, seven pedestrian deaths in the, months of, in the month of December. And so the, the city family came together and just declared, essentially, that that's not acceptable. That, uh, as I said in my opening, uh, you know, we think of ourselves as a, a beautiful, walkable city, yet people walking around our city are getting killed or seriously injured. We have eight or 900 reported pedestrian collisions each year, and that's just what's reported. So, uh, so we did, uh, my board of directors, and then subsequently our board of supervisors, which is basically our city council and 
commissions around the city adopted a goal of Vision Zero <clears throat> to eliminate traffic deaths in San Francisco, as the mayor referenced, uh, in the next 10 years, by 2024 to get to zero. And, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, I guess the other, other city's programs, we definitely looked a, a lot to, to New York and, and to, to Europe where this came from. There's, a, there's the design element, there's the education element, there's the enforcement element, there's the evaluation, but it's really about marshalling uh, the resources of the city and the community and great strong advocates here in San Francisco, uh, everybody kind of coming around to, to a, a very clear and very achieve what should be an achievable goal, but one that will take a lot of work. And it's, uh, I was talking with uh, Mayor Penalosa, the former mayor of Bogota the other day, he was in town, um, and he was talking about how in, you know, in 1900 there were zero traffic fatalities. And then quickly in the 20s there were more people who died uh, on our streets than died, I think, in World War II. Hmm. And yet we just accept 30, 40, 50,000 people dying uh, in our streets and on our highways every year. And I think, I think we're coming to a point, at least starting from our cities, as Jeanette always reminds us, that's where things start in our cities, uh, where we're just not, we're not gonna accept that anymore. Uh, so the, you heard Mayor Lee say $300 million of the <laughs> half a billion that we're asking the voters for this November uh, would be invested in making our streets safer. And it's that, it's working with the police department, with our public health department, with our communities uh, to bring everything we have to bear uh, to make it so that people can walk around our city, can drive around our city, can bike around our city without fear of being seriously injured or killed. You want to weigh in on that? It, well, I would say, uh, again, in a, in a southern uh, Sunbelt city uh, where we built big arterials and big roads, we, we are consistently uh, named one of the more dangerous places in the country mm -hmm. along with our fellow cities in the southeast uh, for pedestrians. Mm -hmm. And and a lot of it really has to do with certainly street design, but it also happens to do with the way uh, development is placed in the, in the environment, where you have a, a large apartment complex on one side of a very busy street and say a grocery store on the other side, or uh, you have bus stops on one side and, uh, and uh, at least on one side of that trip, the user of that, uh, that bus will need to cross the street mm -hmm be there. So oftentimes it's not at a signalized intersection or a place that has been safed up for pedestrians. So that's where we see most of our pedestrian fatalities. Everyone's a heartbreak, but most of them are out on these large suburban-like uh, arterials that have a land development pattern that attracts them to both sides of the street, but not a convenient way to, to get back and forth. Um, so we're uh, starting a, a large effort on sidewalk and pedestrian safety programs that deal with the intersections, they deal with crosswalks, they deal with uh, street design and uh, also deal with trying to bring the land development pattern back into a, a bit of a saner uh, position so that uh, folks that want to walk to these various places uh, can do so uh, more safely. Uh, we have seen a decline in the last year or so of pedestrian fatalities, I'm happy to say. Okay. Um, we've had years where we've had 50 in a year and uh, I think last year we had nine. So it's a, it's a it's a good trajectory. I never take too much pride in that because I know it can turn around uh, very, very quickly. And so we, we have to remain vigilant at all times. I do think education is an important part of it as well as in engineering and design um, and trying to amend the land development pattern. I found that when I, as a result of talking with you, Ed, and learning about Vision Zero, I'm always in a hurry to get someplace. And I find myself making myself take a moment just a moment, so I actually leave 10 minutes early because I want to make sure that I stop at a crosswalk. And sometimes it's really hard to see the crosswalk when you've got trucks double parked on both sides and you have to, everybody mm -hmm. merges to the middle lane. So you find yourself looking left and right. And I guess there's no getting around that, but slowing down works for me. And, and I've traveled overseas and a lot of countries have pedestrian first policies. So I don't know how they get any work done because nobody can get to work because they're always stopping for, so I don't know what, you've got something that is working for you, what is working for your city? Yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to talk about Vision Zero. It's a huge priority for, for my mayor, and just to, to put it in perspective, New York is a very big city. We had last year 293 traffic-related fatalities, so we have big numbers in New York. Now that said, um, the numbers have come down from the historic highs in New York, and one of the challenges we face, we try and be very data-driven when we look at the engineering and enforcement approaches we want to take, and there's now in New York a certain amount of randomness to it. I mean, there's still some hot spots, but 
you know, th through the good work of some of my predecessors, we've tackled a lot of those hotspots. So part of our challenge is we need to look at a lot of things that are targeted and citywide. And one of those is speeding. It is two of the big causes, at least in New York, of traffic fatalities are speeding and what we would call failure to yield, which is whether you have the green light or not stopping when you see a pedestrian. And we were fortunate this year um, up in our state legislature in Albany to get the ability to lower our citywide default speed limit from 30 to 25. <laughs> 50 years ago in New York, the speed limit used to be 25, and the state legislature raised it to 30 for the whole state. Uh, my predecessor then, the, the traffic commissioner 50 years ago, a guy named Henry Barnes, yes, he's the Barnes dance guy, um, objected, but nonetheless, the state did it. And so 50, 50 years ago, 50 years later, we've been able to get that reversed, and now we are about to launch a big public education campaign. It takes, it takes effect on November 7th to get folks to know what the speed limit is, to get them to slow down. But one thing we would say in New York is there's not a lot of stretches where you're driving unimpeded. You know, mainly what slows you down is traffic lights and stop signs. So it, it's really not, you, you probably don't need to leave 15 minutes early. If you're obeying the speed limit and our signals are timed correctly, you'll, 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 make, it to your, you'll make it to your appointment. It's about changing the mindset. Right. And I've noticed in front of San Francisco City Hall, I don't know if anybody has had a chance to see, but they have uh, a lot of lights in the street that flash when people are in the crosswalks. Mm -hmm. And that makes me actually look. So I don't know if that's something that is being used in your cities or not. There have been probably, I don't know, four or five different generations of devices that the, the transportation industry has tried to come up with to help with the problem that you're highlighting, which is that um, people are not always visible. Drivers have a lot of demands on their attention when they're in a car and trying to highlight the most vulnerable user um, has been challenging. So those um, in pavement, this is a really unfortunate name, in pavement flashers, people call them, um, which makes me think <laughs> about all kinds of name. other things. Um, it, but they're, uh, they, were, they were a generation or two ago. People tried them. They were the big thing. They were a hot thing to try. And then cities ripped them out because they didn't work perfectly and now we've moved on to a couple of other things. But um, I think that's, that's evidence that uh, we're trying to get it right. We're trying to, we, we see that there's an issue. Engineers are great at solving problems. They want to solve problems. And so there's been a lot of, of attempts to, to deal with that, uh, you know, to bring attention, to focus it where it needs to be focused. As, as Salita said, there's been a couple iterations. Several years ago, Salt Lake City installed some. The plows ripped them up. They didn't work. Um, we, we abandoned, but we're actually coming back and partnering with the Utah Department of Transportation to try one of the newer iterations on one of our state highways, uh, which is right next to the, it's called the Energy Solutions Arena now, what is it, Delta Center, it's the one <laughs> called the Delta Center, um, where we have a tremendous amount of pedestrian activity, games, concerts, and it's a pilot, and we're looking forward to seeing um, if this new iteration of, and now I'm going to call it in pavement flashers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we, too have, uh, we too have ventured it down in the, to the in-pavement lighting and that sort of thing, and, it just, and we've tested several types of it, and it really doesn't work. So, we, so when we need to have uh, crossings outside of signalized intersections, we've, we've gone more toward the hybrid and overhead uh, type of signalization, mm -hmm. yeah. trying to mark the crosswalks yeah. in, in a yeah. way that made sense. But I do remember Salt Lake City had flags for a while where people we pick still up a flag and cross the street and pick yeah. up another flag. You know, it's cheap. Uh, <laughs> easy, visible, we have them. They're sponsored by our community groups or whoever wants to have a flag program. We set them up with the flag bucket on something. They come and pick up the flags. It's about 25 cents each. Um, and they're all over, they are, the flags are all over the city. They disappear, we just keep putting them it's back. because so They're cheap and they're very, very visible. They've gotten a little bit of bad press recently, um, but w it, it works for us. We've got a whole range of things that we're doing from the flag program, it's been around for a long time, plus we've got seven hawk signals going in this year, the city council, which they, they don't often agree on exactly what we should be investing in, agree every year to fund pedestrian safety improvements, every year to fund pedestrian safety improvements. So right. uh, we're doing a lot of the overheads, still, but still the cheap ones, it, that works too. Okay, good to know. The talk in the news lately has been about Ebola, Ebola outbreaks, mass transportation is going to be a concern, and also terrorism. And so I can't even imagine what your planning and thought processes must be in how to prepare for an emergency like that. Who wants to start with that? Ed? Emergency preparedness is a huge deal. Sure, I'll talk about <laughs> Ebola. Why not? Um, there's an emergency. <laughs> 
emergency <laughs> preparedness um, has been something that the city has invested a lot in. Um, since there was, a, there was an earthquake uh, there uh, called the Northridge earthquake, there's a, a huge center where everybody um, a, from various parts of the, the city comes um, whenever the mayor uh, declares that there's an emergency. Um, there is a, a whole protocol, a communications protocol, um, and a lot of investment in that because, um, and actually right now we have a woman, uh, Dr. Lucy Jones, uh, here uh, in Los, there in Los Angeles, um, telling us about what, what the um, consequences will be of a major earthquake and how we can be better prepared. Um, but then, you know, we, we may be really, uh, I think we are really advanced in the in investments we've made, but we're still way behind where we, we need to be because investing in that kind of emergency preparedness is not something that the city has, has been really, cities in general have been really good at because there are so many other demands. Um, it's hard to, to plan for um, to plan for that when you have so many other demands on a constrained budget. Of course. Well, we've been through, you've been through the Northridge quake, we've been through the Napa quake and the Loma Prieta quake. And, and I'm sure you were around or you certainly know about that and how that affected everything. Yeah, so we just earlier this month commemorated the 25th anniversary of Loma Prieta, which was the earthquake that happened <coughs> right during the World Series. Mm -hmm. The game was being played here in San Francisco. Um, there were uh, uh, some pretty significant damage in the city and in the region, uh, some of which ha has actually had some beneficial consequences from an infrastructure perspective because uh, some of those elevated freeways that were that were compromised are now gone, as, as the mayor referenced. There's been kind of a renewed awareness of the importance of investing in infrastructure, particularly from a seismic uh, safety perspective. Um, so we're, we're trying to make sure that we learn fr from the lessons. Um, and, and like in LA, um, definitely are building much more of a preparedness culture and an all hazards uh, sense. So whether it's an earthquake or a terrorist incident or uh, public health uh, issue and, and we are, we're a city and county here so we do have a county health department that's really leading the charge in terms of the Ebola preparedness. Um, it's, it's something that has been I think much more in the forefront. I think the, the mayors around the country at the U.S. Conference of Mayors, it's a focus for them. Tomorrow morning at our emergency operations center we're having a planning session for the World Series uh, which comes here tomorrow night. So it's definitely at the forefront. I think transportation is always one of the critical support functions that any city's looking at in terms of any kind of the disaster preparation and response. And it was actually uh, two years ago <clears throat> at the NACDO conference in New York, I think I got the, the last plane out of the city before Sandy hit. Oh. And for, for those of us who, who were in New York at the time, for, for Jeanette and all the folks in New York who then had to deal with that, uh, and really are still dealing with it, mm -hmm. Um, it was just it was a, another reminder of how our systems and infrastructure uh, are, can be vulnerable to things that we have not contemplated. They'll take a slightly different uh, tack, though. I think cities really are on the front forefront of disaster recovery and response. Uh, when you call nine one one, it doesn't go to the state, it doesn't go to the federal government, it goes to the city. And so cities tend to be really on the edge of that, have the emergency preparedness centers and response centers uh, set up and ready to go. Um, and we do that, and, I, and I'm always cautious about being uh, so consumed in cities about whatever the outbreak is of the day, whether it's Ebola or whether it's uh, something else. Um, and I think back to why s many cities are the way they are today, and we're trying to repair those and restore those, because um, generations ago, uh, we had a generation of folks that built an awful lot of real estate development that experienced the Great Depression and World War II, and somehow deem cities as unsafe, and so you should spread out and, and not be concentrated in cities. And I think we've seen uh, the kind of <coughs> destruction to urban areas and cities that that has uh, happened. So I think we, we have to be careful to understand that when these things happen in cities, and they do um, on a fairly routine basis, that we are prepared in cities to respond and to help that recovery and bring the aid to people that need the, need the aid in a, in a fairly expeditious fashion. And then when, when we do the first response, then the state comes in, then the federal government comes in and, and backs that up. But it's always really the responsibility of cities to be there on the front lines. Well, because your bus drivers and the, the people who are, are moving those transportation uh, modes around, those are gonna be your frontline people if something happens. So 
Um, I'm just curious as to, do they get any kind of training about emergency preparedness or response? Um, yeah, I mean, look, uh, you know, Ed, Ed referenced in New York, the city has suffered, you know, an enormous natural disaster, which was Hurricane Sandy, mm -hmm. and, and it's true, the city is still recovering from it a couple of years later, and, uh, you know, in fact, the, the, the building that New York City DOT is in, the entire basement was flooded, and we've just, just, I just cut a ribbon reopening parts of it like a week ago. Wow. So that's how long it's taken to restore parts of it. We also do, look, it's quite clear after 9-11, we're the city that is most likely, you know, probably New York and Washington to face real terrorist threats. Mm -hmm. So, you know, luckily New York is a vast city with huge resources, you know, an, an enormous police department and, you know, a very remarkable counterterrorism unit. We have a bunch of transportation agencies and, you know, we spend a lot of time thinking about how to respond to all nature of either, you know, man-made or, or mother nature type disasters. and. There is frontline training and then obviously, you know, working at the highest levels to make sure the challenge we have is to coordinate. I mean, the city is 8.4 million people, the region is 15 million people. Wow. Uh, you know, making sure we'll have a coordinated response. All right, I want to ask everybody what your biggest challenges are right now in terms of moving people around and just making everything work. You can get people to, play, uh, to work, to home, to wherever they need to go. Let's start with you, Rob. Salt Lake City is the capital city. Um, strong commute pattern in and out every day. Our population nearly doubles every single day. These are not Salt Lake City taxpayers. <coughs> so we have to find a way to, <laughs> sorry, I mean. Sounds like you need toll booths. Capital cities know this, that it's very difficult to accommodate the demand for, you know, mobility and movement from Monday through Friday. This is, this is Probably, this is not our only challenge, but this is a really big challenge for us, especially when we've had a lot of success with uh, rail transportation. UTA's 2015 program now really efficiently delivers commuters by rail to our downtown. Um, we still have a very, um, a well-functioning freeway system also delivering people to our downtown. And every day, these people circulate either in and out or within our downtown, and that and the risk of using a term that's overused, this first mile, last mile uh, connection is becoming increasingly important because that's the only way that people will make a different choice of how to travel into the city. And what they do once they get to the city is really <coughs> critical for us. So uh, bike share, better walking environment, increased pedestrian safety, the ability to ride your bike regionally if you choose, um, these are all things that we're, that we're really focusing on. I would say, too, that another challenge that we have in Salt Lake City is definitely that there's a, uh, there's a growing pain going on right now, or as I mentioned earlier, there's high demand for different ways to travel. It's all we talk about when we do have our MPO meetings and we're meeting with UDOT and we're meeting with, you know, there's, it's not all we talk about, but it's a huge topic of conversation because people really want this, but the moment you go to move a shovel on a corridor, it's very difficult. There's such an outcry because I don't believe we've hit that tipping point of um, understanding that as a community we're asking for these things and this is what it takes to build it and you have to make it through that sort of tough part um, to get the, the results that, that you want as a region and as a city. So those are, I gave you two, hopefully that's. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> Who else wants to add to that? I, I think I, we have very much the same. Um, in terms of what we need to do on the streets. I think, you know, thanks to, to NACTO, we have a pretty good understanding that we have the, the playbook from the Urban Street Design Guide and the mm -hmm. Bikeway Design Guide. Uh, kind of figuring out what to do, uh, that's done, um, more or less. In terms of funding, uh, you know, you heard I've got a mayor who's going to bat to get billions of dollars of local investment into the city. So from a funding standpoint, and in part just because our economy is so strong here in San Francisco, Funding is a little bit less our challenge. Our real challenge uh, is the public support for the ch making changes in the right of way. If, if we're, if we're going to make transit work better, and everybody wants transit to work better, if we're going to make our streets safer, more attractive for people to walk and bike, which everybody wants that too, <clears throat> we have to reallocate space in our right of way. There are trade offs, there are conflicts. Um, and actually getting those implemented in the ground, <clears throat> and it's really long before the shovel hits the pavement, getting the support so that we can actually do those things, that's our biggest challenge. 
I forgot so to mention funding too. Sorry, yeah. funding yeah. huge, huge <laughs> challenge. <laughs> well, public and support and then public perception <coughs> too, right? So you have to make sure that you win the hearts and minds of everybody who needs to get around. Is that a difficult job? Yeah, I mean, I think our challenges are really, well, safety first and foremost. I mean, because that is a, we're talking about, and Polly's right, there's a certain randomness to it. And so what we're really talking about is cultural change in how people get around and share the streets. Um, in Los Angeles, the, the homicides are at the lowest they've been since the 50s. We've, to date, we've had about uh, 200 people die in homicides, um, and 148 of them die just trying to get around town. So 118 of those homicides were due to gang violence. You think about the tremendous job that the LAPD has done in investing in preventing gang violence. Um, but we've got more people dying trying to get around town. So, so having that shift in what our priorities are and really getting at the engineering and the education, but the cultural change is the most challenging piece of that and the one that we must get right. Funding is a challenge because of the way transportation finance works, particularly in California. It's a very ratty quilt of about 70 different funding sources that you have to sort of piece together to make a blanket and keep people warm at night and help them move around the city. And um, that's a huge challenge because all of those funding sources are very constrained about what you can, you can use them for. And then communication, um, you know, as a, as a transportation planning and engineering industry, we have done an extraordinarily poor job at communicating with people in plain language about why we're doing what we're doing. And we're so inside our own bubble that we don't even know what we sound like anymore. I was sitting in a meeting with somebody, a woman, very educated. <laughs> right, right, okay, um, thanks. The, and a very smart woman, and I said, well, we're putting in a right turn pocket here. And she looked at me and said, what's a right turn pocket? And I said, wow, I, we just have not done the work to figure out how to talk to people about the trade-offs. And we're only starting to get the data about the outcomes, to be able to talk to people about this investment will help your business. It will keep you competitive. Um, it will save your margins. And here's the evidence, and here are the facts. Um, we haven't had that uh, until very, very recently. So I think that the communication challenges are more expensive, cost us more money than the infrastructure. You know, the process piece of telling the story, getting the buy off, and getting the stamp of approval um, sometimes is equal to or greater than in cost the cost of actually building the project. So maybe you need to have a partnership with your local media. Yes, maybe we do. <laughs> Town hall <laughs> meetings, right? <laughs> because we're trained to think in five second sound bites. So we could take that right turn pocket and translate that for you. <laughs> public perception and winning public support. Yeah, and, and I think the, the first question was what sort of are the things you're, you're worried about? And I, I think it's true that the culture change and what we're doing in terms of safety and, and changing the streetscapes is one piece. And I think in New York, I'm happy to say, I think there's a lot of progress there. And look, there's still, you know, it, it, the city is too large and complicated to get unanimity, but I think in general we're, we're, we're down the road on culture change. So I actually have to jump back to sort of the funding piece. My, my, my mayor likes to ask me this question. He'll say, well, what's, what are you worried about? What keeps you up at night? And um, in New York we have a vast, very old infrastructure. We have what we call our centennial bridges. We have a bunch of large, iconic bridges which carry millions of people every year that are over 100 years old of an old roadway network. And so what I say is, bridges keep me up at night. I hear the most from the public and elected officials about the roadways, and I get sued the most over the sidewalks. Um, <laughs> so, and, and so, you know, and, and there is an enormous, there are enormous capital needs on that front. And then our transit agency recently put out its five-year capital plan, and the, the numbers are very large in New York. It's a, it's a $29, $29 billion, of which they only have half the money in hand and no idea yet where the other half is gonna come from. So we are having, sounds like you're doing it in San Francisco. Uh, we're in New York now having a large debate about the huge capital needs for the city and the region. And in the future, where are we gonna go to find the funds? So that is a big challenge for us. So what keeps you up at night? I'm gonna steal from her. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think our, our challenges really are, are paired with opportunity. And we are a fast growing city. And we are recognizing the shift of market preference and demographics uh, to folks who want to live in a more urban environment. Mm -hmm. And you know, despite our uh, sprawling late 20th century development pattern, there, there are many parts of the city that are very walkable and you would feel like you were in uh, San Francisco or New York or uh, Philadelphia in parts of those cities and those, cities, uh, those parts of the city are growing rapidly. 
we, we have apartment towers going up in Center City, our South End area where we have transit has been a, a great magnet. And we started, started our transit system as an ec economic development and redevelopment opportunity more than we thought of it as a transportation opportunity at the time. And it's been very successful with transportation, but it's, it's been uh, remarkable as an economic development tool. Um, so keeping our eye on uh, em emerging market preferences, uh, and even the real estate industry gets this, they're understanding where their market is going now. And so I think for us, uh, the challenge is keeping up with what people really want out of their cities today. We can't build uh, pedestrian facilities and bicycle facilities fast enough um, to keep up with the demand in those areas. And, and we, I th we think we build it pretty fast and pretty efficiently, but th there's such a tremendous demand for it out there. So I'd say our, our challenges are really connected to the opportunities to, to get it right in this 21st century era. So high-speed rail, we talk about high-speed rail, it's very controversial. Uh, some people in California want it, some don't. I don't know if that's a factor in any of your areas. Well, it is. Um, I, I practiced for 14 years down in Orlando, Florida, and because Orlando was really close to Walt Disney World, everybody that wanted to test something or show their newest technology wanted to do it there. So I think I, I sat through about three iterations of high-speed rail proposals and maglev proposals and those sorts of things. And I always looked back to North Carolina and thought that North Carolina actually did it right. And North Carolina would actually help pay Amtrak for incremental upgrades uh, to their system and, and uh, subsidize routes between Charlotte and Raleigh in particular. And have just slowly over a period of time uh, been able to, to, to get that done. North Carolina is also fortunate in that it owns uh, a cross-state railroad that it was chartered in 1845. So it's been there a long time, so they have access to that. The private railroads uh, travel along it by lease. And so they are now uh, <laughs> under a huge effort to expand and improve and double track that rail system between uh, Charlotte and Raleigh and have incrementally over time picked up the speeds of the trains going forward. We don't see ourselves as truly high speed, 150 mile an hour to 200 mile an hour and higher for quite a while, but we, we are now getting into the range of being very competitive to automobile travel between the two cities. And uh, so it's, I, I think it's, a, it's been a really solid approach. Uh, whereas the Orlando and Florida approach was to get it all done at once, a super high speed rail, give away uh, land development rights and all kinds of things to try to make it happen. And it never really has happened. I, I think there are some good prospects on the horizon for Florida, uh, but I think the, the, the North Carolina experience is probably a bit more pragmatic at, at incrementally improving that service over time. Does anybody see that working for California? Well, so in California we're somewhat taking an incremental approach, uh, one step of which is electrifying Caltrain, uh, which serves the corridor from San Jose to San Francisco, uh, while the, the larger high-speed rail project starts building uh, in the center. I think that likewise at the southern end towards LA, um, they're looking at incremental improvements. But ultimately, uh, despite the controversy and cost, I think there's, there's no question that in the long run we need high-speed rail connection between Los Angeles and San Francisco. About a third of the volume of San Francisco International Airport is just serving that corridor. So our ability to kind of open up uh, the Western United States to Asian markets is, is constrained right now by, by all that air travel uh, just within California. And then likewise, our freeways are, are at capacity. And so it, it ultimately, as the, as the state continues to grow, it's a choice of do we try to widen freeways, and we know how well that works as a transportation management tool, or do we invest in rail? Uh, which is which, clean, which both clean there's opportunity yeah. costs that it saves, or opportunity savings, I guess, from expanding freeways, but it also really opens up our airports, and it'll be just such a much better way for folks to travel. We've got uh, San Jose now as a NACTO city to get uh, move up and down the peninsula between San Jose and San Francisco, and then down to LA. Um, it, it needs to happen. Sixty-eight billion dollars is a is a daunting uh, daunting amount. But just as the interstate highway system was built incrementally, like what Danny's talking about, I, th I think the same will ultimately happen on the Northeast Corridor and in California at a minimum. 
Well, New York, everybody takes the train, don't they? Yeah, and actually train ridership is surged in the Northeast, as has transit ridership, and, and we face a challenge in New York. We were talking about Hurricane Sandy. Um, there is sort of through a historical unfortunate accident only two rail tunnels that come underneath the Hudson River between New Jersey and New York. It's a huge bottleneck, and it, it pours into Penn Station, which probably most people in this room have been to. A, a subterranean station that was designed to take 200,000 people a day and now take 600,000 people a day. And Amtrak recently announced that the, you know, the tunnels were inundated during Sandy with salt water and they're basically gonna have to take one out a lot of the time and start repairing it. It's gonna have a huge effect on travel all along the Northeast Corridor on the East, you know, on the East Coast of the United States. And it's prompting a real regional discussion about the need to build another set of tunnels under the Hudson, improve Penn Station, improve some of the rail infrastructure in New Jersey. The, the name of the project is Gateway, and it's, it too has a big, a big price tag, probably around 15 billion, but Amtrak's latest announcement has really got people in, in, in the New York and New Jersey region talking about, well, how are we gonna make this happen? Anybody else wanna weigh in on it? Because we're almost out of time, and I wanted to ask you one final question before we, we have to leave. Um, you've all brought up some amazing topics and, and in-depth when you leave, what do you want your legacy to be? So I'm just going to start with you, Danny, and we'll come back to Polly. What do you want your legacy to be? Well, I really do think it comes back to uh, reducing pedestrian fatalities, uh, creating places within our community that uh, truly are walkable and places where people want to be. Uh, tremendous energy, energy today around bicycling infrastructure in the city. We, when I came to work uh, in Charlotte in 2002, we had one mile of bike lane in the city. Today we have 174 miles. Um, still, you know, a lot of momentum, lots to do. Uh, and so I think those two modes uh, for us right now are what we're, what we're really focused on trying to improve. Mm -hmm. Uh, legacy of <laughs> partnership and collaboration. There's no way that as, um, as cities we're going to be able to do what we need and want to do by ourselves. It's, it's impossible. There's partnerships that we will have to have to reach whatever goal it is that you have for your city. You're not going to be able to do it by yourself. Um, Utah has been called that there's like secret sauce heard about collaboration and partnership and we're all trained, we've all come up in Utah trained that you're going to have to work together um, and it's across some really interesting lines in Utah, you know, some unexpected um, alliances and partnerships um, but they're so important and I, I would like my legacy to be that we had goals for the city that we achieved by reaching out to our partners, getting the help that we needed and really capitalizing on each other's success, um, that, that would really be it. I guess um, a few things. One is that, that people aren't dying uh, in our streets. I think, you know, very straightforward. I, I think mm -hmm. that, that should be all of our, all of our goal. Um, a, a second would be um, better, more sustainable travel choices for more trips in San Francisco. So people have better options of how to get around and that the car really is a, a last resort mm -hmm. um, in terms of how people make trips in San Francisco um, the, the third would be infrastructure that's in a state of good repair. Uh, like we don't have 100-year-old uh, bridges, but we have 100-year-old facilities. We have a 100-year-old transit system. Uh, we'd like to, to leave that and the rest of our transportation assets in a state of good repair. And then finally, uh, as for the organization um, to improve the organization so it's you know, the best transportation agency in the country. Oh, there's a challenge. <laughs> right? <laughs> we think he has a ways to go. But, yeah. <laughs> He's got to say that. <laughs> uh, well, so I've been in Los Angeles for two months. So, legacy. <laughs> You're still uh, thinking about it, right? <laughs> right. Um, no, no, seriously, I, I, you know, signals in the, in the streets were running before I got there. They'll, they'll be running after I leave. But um, I really hope that uh, we, in, we can create a, a culture of safety. Um, and of great, uh, great management and being a great place to work. That, that is a huge challenge for the city um, and that is the way that I'm gonna be able to deliver more uh, with less is by um, really around engaging the people who come to work every day, who take a lot of pride in what they do and investing in them. Um, and that's, that's the focus. We just came out with our strategic plan. It really clarifies 
what our priorities are. There are many of the things that everybody has mentioned, giving people choices, getting to great outcomes, giving people more time to spend with their families, uh, making local businesses resilient and strong, and all of those things. But, um, but you know, building that culture of safety that sticks, um, that, that is there uh, forever, um, is, is one of the things that, the biggest challenges and the, the thing that I hope we can invest most of our time in. All right, Holly. Uh, I think New York is probably the leading edge of what I think many people in this room would view as the urban renaissance that has occurred in the United States. And in New York, it, it sprung from a few things, but investment in transportation infrastructure was, was one of the big ones. New York was notorious 25 years ago for having one of the most dangerous, decrepit subway systems. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, at, at one point, we shut down one of our major bridges because pieces of it were crumbling. A chunk of one of our highways fell and killed a dentist from New Jersey. So, and, and the city, you know, speaking of partnerships, made a very concerted political effort working with the state and the federal government and the business community to turn that around and make incredible investments in our infrastructure. And likewise, tackled some of the public safety issues, both the crime rate and also public safety on the roadways. And I think, you know, I view, I think the, I view my job is to do what I can to continue what has been a tremendous renaissance in New York. The city is booming. And, and just one of the priorities of my mayor, something that we, we face at the urban level and it's a national challenge, to make sure that those benefits that, that all the citizens get it, you know, that, it's, that it's, there's a real sense of equity and that to the neighborhoods that have perhaps not had the boom that all the city has, that we can extend great transportation and economic prosperity there as well. All right, ladies and gentlemen, the commissioners panel, thank you all so much. <laughs>